Welcome to the Bethel Family Worship Center. If you're looking for something fresh, real, and powerful in your life, you've come to the right place. Connect with us on social media to get live stream service notifications, podcasts, and up-to-date information on upcoming events. We're so glad you've decided to join us here at Bethel Family Worship Center for a life-transforming message and would love to hear how God is impacting your life through this ministry. So share your experience with us in the comments below. Also, if you want to be a part of what BFWC is doing in the city of Indianapolis and beyond, you can contribute financially by visiting bfwc.net forward slash giving and choose the option that works best for you. We hope you enjoy today's message. We're going to continue part five of the series that we've been in called Preparing for Promotion. Most everyone I meet wants to walk into a promotion. Some would be maybe hesitant because they've received promotions before and realize that there came a great cost. And when you are promoted to the supervisor and you only make a dime more than the people who have been your lunch table friends and now they've given you a hard time because you're the soup. <laughs> and you're like, I don't know if this promotion was worth it. <laughs> but that's not what I really want to focus on. I want to focus on the fact that God has promotion for you. You didn't just start where you are to, to come to a dead end or to live a life that is full lifeless, or where you're scratching your head all the time saying, there's got to be more. We've been in a series on this, and every week has been a little different. And last week I shared this thought, when God, when. When you have asked God, when are you going to do it? You gave me a dream, a vision. I saw myself standing before a sea of people, I saw myself launching a new company, a business. I went out on a limb. And I'm wondering when is it going to happen? So all of us have said, when, God, when. I would talk to some who were praying that God would give them a spouse. And I remember when I wanted a spouse. And I remember when I had prayed and said, Lord, please don't let the rapture come until I get married. Anybody ever pray that? Amen, I did. I said it. And I meant it. <laughs> Amen. Now, if you're sitting next to your spouse, you better be, you all be loving doving on one another right now because God gave you the desire of your heart. Amen. I, I, you, you, you're not amen and real loud, but... <laughs> When God when. I shared with you that God gives us dreams and visions for our lives, but he hides the exact timing. He always gives you direction, but you don't always have the timing. And I shared many years ago to this house, and it is repeated as it's a repeated phrase. You will hear us say that if you have the timing of God and the direction of God together, that's when you have the intersection of opportunity. So you need the timing of God as well as the direction of God. You can have the direction but be out of time. Hmm. So I shared also that if we knew how long we had to wait, sometimes we would give up. So that's why God don't reveal everything to us, especially the time. Because we would put it off and say, well, I'll come back and really get involved in about 10 years since that's when God said he was going to... Or we would have said, what do you mean it's going to take three years? I don't know if I like this. So we are tempted to give up so God has to hide some things from us. <laughs> if I knew how long I had to wait, I would be tempted to give up. And then I shared that we are called in Luke 19, 13 to occupy until he comes. So I don't have the luxury of saying, well, you know, it's not moving fast enough. We're literally supposed to do business till he returns. So occupy. 
like Jesus, we place our times in his hands. And this is very interesting because if you follow the path of Jesus, even his own family tried to push him out of time. Friends tried to push him out of time. But God could not be pushed out of time. Jesus said, my time is not yet come. So there were times that other people were excited for him and wanted him to go to Jerusalem and take over. And some were saying, don't go to Jerusalem because they're going to kill you. And so he knew what time it was. What time is it? I went to a church one time, and they said, convention time. <laughs> they just kept saying, what time is it? Then, convention time. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that had nothing to do with what I'm saying. But <laughs> don't let anybody push you uh, out of time. Amen? Push you away from God's timing. If you get ahead of God, you could cause a lot of trouble for yourself. If you get behind God, and lag, you could be in trouble as well. So it's important that we place our time in his hand. Amen? Amen? This is what we call letting patience have her perfect work so that we may be perfect, entire, and wanting for nothing. James chapter 1 says, let patience have her perfect work. He refers to patience in the female gender says, let patience have her perfect work. And then he says, Here, here's what will happen, that you may be perfect. Now, we know that that doesn't mean that we're without blemish. That doesn't mean that we're uh, photo ready for a cover shoot. Photoshop can take pounds off you, make your face smooth. You ever seen somebody overdo their filters and then say, how y'all going to accuse me of using a filter? Because <laughs> I've seen you. <laughs> anyway. Now, I will say it don't hurt to touch up. And somebody said, well, I don't know if I like that. Well, you touched up tonight, didn't you? Well, some of you did. Amen. You got touched up. Put on a little fragrance, brush your teeth. That's a touch-up. Amen? Did your hair. Amen? Cleaned your ears. Did all that kind of stuff. You touched it up. But that's not the perfect he's talking about. Perfect in this sense is mature, that you come to a place of maturity where you grow up. And then entire, he says be perfect and entire. That means everything about you even down to your soul, is content in God. That you are not a person that's antsy, uh, anxious, always wish you were somewhere else than where you are. When you learn how to be content, then you learn how to walk in the entirety of God, and he possesses you body, soul, and spirit. Then he says that you're wanting for nothing. That means that you have the right supplements, the right things that you need. Maybe you are a person here tonight that takes vitamins. I would encourage you to keep on taking vitamins. It don't hurt. It is so that we are wanting for nothing. And sometimes we have deficiencies in our life. Uh-oh. I don't have time to go into the spiritual deficiencies. But you know the natural deficiencies where we lack things like magnesium. Or, or, or we need a, a little extra of this. So spiritually, he says, if you will let patience have her perfect work, the result will be that you will be mature, that you will be very entirely content, and that you will also have need of nothing. You won't have to have this to satisfy you. God will sustain you and keep you. And most of that, can I just say, if all he did was keep me in my right mind. Come on, talk to somebody. If all he did was keep me in mo my mental mind. This is where the fight is a lot of time. Most of the time. Tonight I want to show you the, the way to your promotion. 
as you grow through, write this down, the seasons of your life. The seasons of your life. I was sitting on the patio today and had an opportunity to set out the cushions and the, clean the furniture and, and get the hoses ready and turn the water back on for the spigots and all that kind of stuff. And I said, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful weather. Did anybody thank him? When it's so good. Amen. Some people didn't come to church because they sit out there thanking him. <laughs> but I was thanking him today. And I said, Lord, I thank you for the spring, the summer, the fall, and the winter. And then I began to reflect and say, we've really not had much of a winter. I did not one time have to use my snowblower. And I'm thankful for it because it keeps lazy people like myself happy. Come on. Now, I did use the, sh the snow shovel, but I always have that snow plow so that I can wave at my neighbors while I'm... <laughs> Come on. You know we're having fun. But not at one time, Brother Juan, did I have to use my snowblower. And so I thank the Lord. Now, there will be probably uh, some residuals that we'll face, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to talk about the seasons of our lives, and I'm thankful for all the seasons. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3 and 1, to everything, there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. There's a season when it's appropriate to suck your thumb. There's a season when it's appropriate to have a pacifier. There's a season when it's appropriate to drink from a baby's bottle. <laughs> but it is, when that season is over, it then becomes very inappropriate to continue in that manner. Look over somebody, don't even say anything. Just look at them. There's a right time and a wrong time for every matter under the sun. That's what the Bible says. When we are mature enough to be able to discern the seasons, it's a good thing. When I'm mature enough and I have now factored in my discernment, I discern what season I'm in. That is not only a good thing, that is a very good thing. But rushing through one season to get into another season can cause you all kinds of problems. Now, I shared with you that I didn't even have to use my snowblower one time. If we have a warm winter, then we love living in the Northeast Midwest region. It's great until we discover that it never got cold enough to kill off the insects. Therefore, the result are bugs, 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 and bugs. And I've noticed that even in this worship center, sometimes we have these little ladybugs. I've been preaching before. They'd be fighting me up here. <laughs> I see them in the haze. <laughs> see them on the screen. Now, if the frost and the freeze, don't, if it don't get cold enough, it don't kill the bugs. I preached a message on this not long ago. And then sinus and allergy sufferers, they appreciate a good freeze because it kills the pollen and it brings peace to your sinuses. Come on. There's four seasons we're going to discuss tonight and I'm going to start with this one, the plowing season. Plowing season, and again, we're talking about getting to your promotion. Plowing is working. It's just working. In Luke chapter 9, verse 62, Jesus told him, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, if you put your hand to the plow, don't look back once you've engaged the plow. When you're working hard, do not think about how it used to be when you were not working that hard. Because if you look back, the Bible said that we're not fit for the kingdom. 
when we begin to look back and say, I wish it was different. I wish I could go back to Egypt and eat the leeks and the garlic when I was a slave in Pharaoh's brickyard baking bricks in, his, in that hot sun beating over my head. But if you look back, that's when problems come. In 1 Corinthians 9 and 10, the Bible teaches us that if we're going to plow, we should plow in hope, thinking about our harvest. Plow thinking about harvesting instead of plowing. Look what the scripture says. Wasn't he actually speaking to us? Yes, it was written for us so that the one who plows and the one who threshes the grain might both expect, believe, there it is, a share of the harvest. So when I plow, I don't think about the plowing, I think about the harvest. That's the scripture that speaks from Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. The definition that I would give tonight on plowing is this, the time I just plain don't want to do what the word says to do. And that would describe a lot of us, myself included. When God's word says, this is what I want you to do, but plowing is hard work. And I just don't want to do it. I don't want to get up early. I don't want to stay up late. I don't want to break a sweat. I want to lose the weight but not go to the gym. Plowing says, I just don't want to do this. But plowing is essential to fallow ground. Fallow ground must be plowed. And we are people who are fallow ground. The Bible says in Hosea 10 and 12, break up your fallow ground. I said, plant the good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow up the hard ground of your heart. For now is the time to seek the Lord that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. He says, you must plow up the fallow ground of your heart. The preacher can't do it for you. The prophet can't prophesy it to you. And enough oil in the vessels to pour on your head for you to come to that, you've got to plow yourself. If I have fallow ground in my life, hard places, I can't wait on someone else to do it for me. i got to put in my own work. I have to do my own due diligence. Mm. That represents the preparation of blessings. That if I'm willing to, to break up the fallow ground in my heart, deal with my issues, then I am preparing myself for the blessings of God upon my life. Fallow ground, this is what it is, the areas of our lives that have been lying dormant. Areas of your life that have not been dealt with, my God. They've remained the same as before because we've not allowed God to have access to these areas in our life. The ground is us. The ground is you. Elbow somebody appropriately and say, the ground is you. It's you. Do you remember in Matthew 13 when Jesus is teaching the parables and he talks about the kind of soil that God's seed is falling on? That, that there were some hard places and, and there were some places that it was easy to take root. The soil is you and I. The seed is God's word. We are the follow ground. And then the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 and 9, for we are both God's workers and you are God's field. You are God's building. So if I am a field according to the scripture, then I must stay under cultivation and allow the Holy Spirit to garden my soul, to garden my life, to pull up the weeds, to get the rake out, the hoe out, that pickaxe if needed, <laughs> and get down to business on the fallow places of my life. Now, don't look at nobody, but we all know people that have got some hard places in their life that they refuse to let God address. It's fallow ground. You have to break it up to prepare yourself for the harvest. Hebrews 12, verse 5 through 12, talks about the chastisement of God is in the plowing season. Remember, I said plowing is hard work. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children, he said? I'm going to read this to you. My child, don't take light of the Lord's discipline. Uh-oh. 
and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines, he chastens those he loves, and he punishes each one of us as he accepts as his child. Now, you know, you know when Paul's, we're getting this kind of letter, we, this is the moment for the grace people that we want to just really heavily avoid this part where God says that he chastens, he deals with, he corrects, he has to rebuke us. Come on, shouting ground right here. But he says, as you endure, verse 7, the divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and you're not really his child at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, should we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? This is where the Bible says that when you discipline a child, you free their soul. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. <laughs> but afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Then he says in verse 12, so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. And I thought to myself, man, that passage is so rough and so good at the same time because I want him to discipline me. If God ever stops disciplining me, if God ever stops saying, ah, 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 I don't ever want to get to that place where I am dull of hearing and my conscience is seared like wax. Come on. That I no longer sense him dealing with me. If you uh, give yourself over to sin repetitively and you're not walking in relationship with God with a heart of contrition, even repentance, you could come to a place where your conscience becomes seared, where you're no longer convicted of the sin that you're doing. So I don't want God to stop speaking to me. Come on. I don't want God to ever just turn me away and say, I'm done. Take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. If we give up in the plowing season, we never will enjoy the harvest. So it's my responsibility to plow up my own fallow ground. I can't say, well, the preacher would have preached the right message. The ushers would have sat me in the right spot where I wasn't distracted. No, I, I have responsibility for me. I have responsibility to bring my family to church on Wednesday night even. Because I promise you, there's no trophy like the crown of righteousness that your child will receive when you raise them up and put God first. Here's a second season. So we have the plowing season. Here's the second one, the seed time season. To me, seed time represents learning to do the will of God. And I, I'm going to stay here for a minute. When you're learning how to do the will of God, you've come through the plowing season where you've let God break up some things in your life, your old ways, your old habits, your parents' ways, their habits, their traditions. Come on. Not all of it was bad, but there's some stuff that need to be broke off of us. Generational bondages and curses that need to be loosed from us through the blood of Jesus, re repented of, renounced, and cast off in the name of Jesus. But now you move into seed time season where you're now learning how to do the will of God. Each time I choose God's will instead of my will, I am planting a good seed that will eventually bring a good harvest in my life. And it's usually over much repetition. When I keep planting good seeds... I'm going to get a good harvest. Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower teaches us that the seed is God's word. 
Remember, you're the soil. I'm the ground. You're the ground. I'm responsible for my soil. But his seed is the word. And so Mark 4, Jesus talks about the parable of the sower when he teaches us that the seed is God's word. And he says in this passage, be a doer, not just a hearer. Amen? Be a doer and not just a hearer. In James chapter 1, verse 21 through 25, the Bible says that the word has power to save your soul. Just the word, just the seed. The Bible says in verse 21, so get rid of the filth and the evilness in your lives and humbly accept the word of God has planted in your hearts. This is where it is. For it has the power to do what? To save your soul. So the word is the seed and that seed has the power to save my soul. So it has to be implanted and it has to be rooted in your heart. We must hear it first but we are blessed in the doing. Yes, I heard it, but the doing of the word is where the harvest is going to come to pass in my life. Because I'm not just a hearer, but I'm a doer. Hearing is like having a package of seeds at home in your kitchen drawer. You know that one drawer that's got everything in it? You got that one drawer that's got so much junk. But don't nobody clean it out because I know everything is in that drawer. Come on. <laughs> having the seed is like having that package of seeds in that drawer. But doing the word is planting that seed in good ground. Then and only then can you expect a harvest. Hearing the word is like keeping the package of seeds in your drawer at home. Church after service after service. Message after message. We can't even remember what last Sunday's message was. We hear the word so much. We are inundated with the word. We do not have a problem for the word. It is always fresh because the word is fresh. No matter who delivers it. Come on. The word is always fresh. The bread is always fresh. Amen. So we hear it, and we hear it with great joy. But a lot of times we take it and put it in the glove box of our car right after church, and we're a hearer, but we're not a doer. We're not putting the seed in the ground, letting it shape us, letting it shape our family. Come on, church. Pastor, hurry up because i got to get to the Colts game. Somebody's, somebody's priorities are way off. Ain't nothing wrong with the Colts game. But what I'm saying is you have to seek first God. If you want a harvest that is radically going to change your family and change your life, I can't just hear a word. i got to hear it with joy, and then I have to plant it in the fallow ground and the soil of my heart so that I can receive my harvest in days to come. In John chapter 13, Jesus teaches his disciples the principle of washing one another's feet. And then he says in verse 17, if you know these things, blessed and happy to be envied are you if you practice them, if you act accordingly and really do them. He's saying God will bless you for doing it. And I, I want you to understand, Jesus was trying to teach his disciples, before I exit here, here's a principle I want you to not only do here, but I want you to do it. Because it will do something in your life. It'll break up the pride in your life when you get down to wash someone else's nasty feet. Come on. When we had foot washing service growing up, they announced it ahead of time. You know why? So you could get your toenail clippers out. Anybody want to help me now? But what if we just did a surprise foot washing tonight? I'm just trying to get you to understand. Jesus was saying, i got to take the starch of pride out of you. So if I teach you a principle and you will do it, you will reap a harvest in your life. In Matthew 7 and 21, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
but only those who actually do the will of my Father. Wow. That's saying something, Jesus. How do you interpret that? He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter in. But only those who do the will of my Father. Now, that just busted somebody's theology. Because we're over here in La La Land living our best life. He said, only those that do the will of my Father in, will enter. Mm, man, I don't like that, Pastor. Well, I didn't say it. Jesus did. In Luke 6, 47, it's, you know the story about the man who built his house upon a rock. He was able to sustain himself when the storm came. In Ecclesiastes 12 and 13, it talks about obedience, that obedience is the adjustment to all inharmonious circumstances. So I learn how to adjust myself as circumstances unfold. This is the verse. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God, Solomon says, and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. Fear God and obey his commands. Well, pastor, that's, that's Old Testament. Well, it is, but it's also principle. To fear God and obey his commands. So it is the root of all character. It is the source of happiness. And it's the full original duty of man. The Bible says the final conclusion, fear God, obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. I want you to write this down. Obedience is the seed that brings the harvest. Obedience is the seed that brings the harvest. So I take the seed that I hear, and I am obedient to plant the seed, and obedience becomes now the seed that brings the harvest. There will always be a season, hear me, of obeying God in a greater way prior to a greater harvest. Every time that God has taken Beverly and I to another level spiritually, and I'm not talking about being promoted to a title or a function. I'm not talking about geographically, Ooh, God's moving on, up. we're moving on up. No, 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 no. Every time that God has taken us to another level in the spirit, it first required a level of sacrifice on our part, a greater level of sacrifice. There was times when we were, God called upon us and, and said, I want you to sow into this ministry. I want you to give this amount at church. I want you to do this or that. And it was a struggle because we didn't have it or we didn't think we had it. And we had to learn to obey the Lord. And we had to learn to say yes to him in obedience because God was trying to extract essence out of us. He was trying to get fragrance out of us. He was trying to get the essence, the very best of the oil extracted. He wanted to bring us to another level. Every time that God took us to a spiritual level in a greater measure in depth, it always went first. We had to take a great sacrifice. We didn't see it at the time. We didn't even realize that what was what was happening. But now looking back, I know that God was testing us. God was allowing us to hear his voice and saying, if you'll do this. He didn't even tell me what he was going to do. I'm telling you, when God told us the first time that we gave an automobile away to someone who was in need, we had just paid the automobile off. I was so excited. I didn't want to have no more payment. And I was thanking the Lord. And then the Lord said, take the title and take the vehicle and give it away. I said, what? <laughs> But we obeyed the Lord. I went home and I told Beverly, I, I said, Beverly, God spoke to me about our vehicle. And she said, he told us to give it away, didn't he? I was wanting her to say, now we're going to put that, we're going to put that money aside. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And, and because I knew we, we operate in agreement, but, but she said the same thing that God had said, and I knew we had to obey the Lord. And so we, that night, I mean, that night we took the title over to these people's house and, and uh, she followed behind me in the van and I was saying all my goodbyes to the vehicle. <laughs> You've been good to me. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. I, I mean, I was, 
And then we went, knocked on the door and said, the Lord told us to come over here and give you this vehicle. They needed a vehicle. God met the need. And we went home walking in the be obedience. But what we did not know was we were planting a seed for what was coming. Hallelujah. That God would bless us coming in and bless us going out. There will always be a season of obeying just prior to your season of harvest. I'm preaching to somebody here. If you've been stingy and tight-fisted, you better get Get ready because God may require of you finances. He may require of you faith. He may require something else uh, uh, from you. But whatever it is, if you'll give it to God and plant the seed and obey the word and do what God tells you to do, I tell you that they who sow in tears will reap in joy. Everybody say the plowing season. Everybody say the seed time season. So there'll be a season where you will have to learn how to sow. Third season, and there's four of them, but here's the third one, the waiting and weeding season. The waiting and weeding season. And I know I got a church house full of these folks. Always, when's God going to do it for me? He's done it for everybody yet. I'm not making fun. I can preach like this and teach like this because I have been this. The waiting and the weeding. No fun. Got me over here serving. Now, I know that's not none of you because you're sanctified. But I know we can, most of us in this room, and I got a big group of people I know that are in the waiting and the weeding season. After obedience... We enter a time of waiting. A time of waiting. I could just, this whole message could be right here, Pastor Hill. During that time, God is still dealing with us, teaching us to keep weeds out of our life. Genesis 8, 22, as long as the earth remains, there will always be seed time and harvest. Amen? Planting, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day, and night. And nowhere does God say, I can't, I, I can't, I can't, I can't, mm. Uh, mm, uh, mm. I can't, I can't, I can't, Indiana, I can't. <laughs> what? You can't? You can't? That tell me everything I need to know about you. Mm -hmm. As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day, and night. Between the seed and the harvest is what we call time. Somebody write that down. Between the seed and the harvest is what we call time. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. King James said, due season's coming. <laughs> Fainting is giving up if you don't give up. If you faint, you give up. If, if you have certain medical conditions... You can faint from not eating. Amen? So be sure to eat the word and drink in his presence, especially when you're in a waiting season. That's not the time to be on Netflix. Between your seed time and your harvest, there's this time. What you do in that time accelerates you or slows you down. It's during the waiting times that I eat the word. It's during the waiting times that I drink in his presence. When I don't know if they're going to lay me off. I'm waiting on an answer. That's not the time to lay out a church. If you got problems, that ain't the time to say, well, since I'm going through this, I ain't going to go to church on Sunday because I need me some me time. That's the time to drink in his presence. 
That's the time to get as close as you can to the Word. Jeremiah said, I found your words and I ate them, and they were joy to the rejoicing of my heart. Jesus said, if any man is thirsty, let him come and drink from me. How you wait determines whether you can wait for the harvest or not. It's how you wait determines whether or not you can wait for the harvest. So let me give you a few of them. Wait patiently. Don't be frustrated and upset all the time. Amen? Don't look at nobody because I know all of us deal with that. We all do. We don't want to wait on anything. I just listed this item for sale and nobody's called me. Well, you just put it on the market. Wait patiently. And then secondly, wait expectantly. Wait with hope. I'm expecting God. Well, it's not going fast enough, is it? Well, I'm expecting God. Oh, I thought you said God was going to come through. I'm, I'm expecting God. Oh, I thought, he was going to, I thought he was a healer. What happened? I'm expecting God. Thirdly, wait with a positive attitude. Don't walk around depressed, come into church, hoping somebody's going to call you out because you look miserable. <laughs> Have you ever been to that service and seen them people? They want to be called out so bad they look like this in the seat. <laughs> the Bible said if you're on a fast, wash your face. Don't come in here looking like you've been got rug burn on your chin. Wait with a positive attitude. Number four, wait expecting God to bring the harvest. And I would say this because this is where I would caution the waiters and the weeders. Don't look to man. If you do, you'll get disappointed and that will cause you to faint further. You'll birth Ishmael's instead of Isaac's. Wait expecting God, not man. Well, God's not fast enough, so I'm going to get on eHarmony.com. God ain't moving fast enough for me, so I am single and ready to mingle. Do you know what I mean? Wait on God, or you'll wish to God. <laughs> Let patience have her perfect work. <laughs> Don't look to man because if what happens is instead of waiting on God for it, we start trying to figure God out and say, well, if I do this, Lord, if the, if the stoplight turns green when I pull up to Lyndhurst, <laughs> then I'll know it was you. I hope you hit every red light. <laughs> Don't do that kind of stuff. God's not hooky spook. Amen. We don't play Cracker Jacks with God. Let me talk about weeding. Weeding during this season is where God deals with us about the little things. So it's the waiting and the weeding. Whew. It's the little foxes, the Bible said, that spoil the vine. If we're faithful over little things, we'll be made ruler over that which is much. You can't, you can't sign up to serve and then always call off a half hour before service. It's not good etiquette. That's not good character. That speaks of you. Got to be faithful to the little things if you want something bigger. He deals with the little attitudes that are harmful to the harvest. He deals with the little compromises that are harmful to the harvest. Well, nobody saw. I just hit that car. Nobody saw. They didn't need me to put that shopping cart in the corral. He deals with procrastination in our lives. It seems like a little things, but it causes great damage into our life. You've got to deal with it. He deals with laziness and continually reminds us that weed pulling is hard work. So says, get up off that couch and do something. Read your Bible. Pray. Soak in the Word of God. Soak in the presence of the Lord. Because while you wait, you still have to weed. Until Jesus calls me home, and I'd say the same for you, but until he calls me home, there's always something in me he's going to be after because I'm not home yet. 
He's weeding me. And then he says, now it's your responsibility now that you know. You start weeding too. John, Jonah chapter 2 and verse 5, Jonah said the weeds were trapped about my head. Seaweed got me. Paid to get out of the will of God. Got on a boat, didn't care whose boat it was, just as long as it wasn't in the will of God. And all them people whose boat he got on lost all their stuff supporting this backslidden prophet. There's some people, they don't care where you're going. They just want to get on your boat and use you. You better tell them, get off my couch, get off my boat. You better get to getting, because I can't have that in my life. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. Sometimes we have weeds in our mind that have to be pulled out. The wrong kinds of thinking that have long roots all the way back to your childhood and your grandparents. It takes time to get them out. And it has to be carefully extracted so it doesn't damage the rest of you. Whew. The Holy Spirit knows how to get the weeds out of us and encourage us to do the same. Waiting is also a time of rooting. So it's not only weeding, but it's rooting. When we don't get things at the time we would like to, it drives me deeper to God. I have to run deeper into God. Ephesians 3 and 17 says that you may be rooted deep in his love and founded securely in his love. Part of your harvest will be security. That nobody's going to take it from you. Amen? Because you're rooted. But it comes because you're rooted not just in what he has for you, but you're rooted in his love for you. And now that I know he loves me and I love him and he has got me, I don't have to perform to get more of his love. I could never do anything to get him to not love me. Security is part of my heritage. Colossians 2, 7, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. The illustration is like the Chinese bamboo. The Chinese bamboo tree does not grow above ground hardly at all for the first four years. It is developing a massive root system, and in the fifth, years, fifth year, it grows nearly 80 feet because it has a great root system. While you wait, get rooted. Don't be jumping from church to church. Don't be jumping from ministry to ministry. Don't be jumping from job to job. Get rooted. Get established. Trust God during the waiting and the weeding because I promise you, he is making arrangements for a super abundance in your life that will be far above anything that you could have ever hoped or dreamed or asked for. While I wait, I got to weed. While I wait, I got to get rooted. And I'll end with number four, the harvest season. Hey! Y'all ain't going to say amen to the harvest season? I mean, the rest of it was hard work. But here we now are in the harvest season. So I said this to you, and I want to give you all of these. You can screenshot them as they come. The harvest season, number one, is where the desires of your heart manifest. Where prosperity manifests. Where favor, promotion, and honor manifest. God makes your enemies to be at peace with you. He brings justice for past injustices, and you begin to enjoy peace. Somebody ought to praise the Lord just for these six things. When I'm in my harvest season, God begins to manifest things for me. He will give me favor and promotion, make my enemies be at peace with me, give me justice for past injustice. You moved ahead. You moved ahead on me. Now I'm going to number seven. You are free from guilt and condemnation. When I'm in my harvest season, my anointing is released to bless others. You are never blessed just to bless yourself. You are blessed to be a blessing to someone else. Send somebody some candy. Send somebody some chocolate. Send somebody a frozen cake. Send me a, I mean, send somebody a Starbucks gift card. Joy, you have a calm delight, and your normal mood is joyful. We don't have to wonder which one of you is showing up, Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde. You hear from God. You enjoy his manifest presence, and you can sense he's with me. 
all the time and prayer becomes like breathing, it is no longer an effort. Pray at all times. When you are living in your harvest season, number 13, you're able to adapt and adjust yourself to others. Oh, this will preach. I'm adapted. I can adapt. If they need me to move, I move. If I need to fill in, I fill in. I am cross-trained. I'm cross-referenced. I'm, I'm in season, in season, and out of season. I know how to become. I know how to abase. I know how to abound. I know how to become all things. If they need me in the parking lot, I'll bundle up. I went to a conference in Houston where uh, Apostle Don Norton, one of our spiritual fathers, he has a young man that leads worship part of, of one of the campuses. In fact, it's the CT Espanol campus with pastors Alex and uh, Evelyn Garo, who have been here to minister just this recently marriage conference. And Rafa is the name of their worship pastor, and he has a tremendous worship, one of the finest and one of the best that I've heard. And he has developed over time. He's just gotten better and better and better. And now they don't bring in, they don't hire in uh, musicians and singers when they put their conference on because their team has become so good and so uh, such a blessing and have honed their skill. My God, I feel like I'm preaching about Bethel Family Worship Center who released his first album last year and will release another one this year. Hey, I, I'm talking about what God is able to do and what God will do through his people. And Rafa, he would always get up and lead at this major conference with thousands of people there. And here he is on his guitar and he's leading the whole team and he's given the set list and he's a practice and they're all doing a tremendous job. One year he's out up on stage. The next year we go to see and he is in the parking lot with a vest and he's directing traffic and somebody said Rafa why aren't you up leading worship he said because they needed me here I needed to oh I would to God uh, that we would understand uh, that you can adapt and adjust yourself when you are in your harvest season, you don't have to have a front row seat. You don't have to have a reserved seat. Nobody has to take your shoes off and put your preaching shoes. You don't need 20 armor bearers and you only got 15 in your congregation. This past weekend, Pastor Bev had to go to Ohio to minister to her mom and dad. Her dad's not been 100%. And I was headed to Kentucky to minister for Bishop Terry Lewis. And I asked Damien to go with me. I, he armor bears a lot. And I said, are you free to go? And he checked his schedule. And he checked with the boss. I mean, checked with Marissa. <laughs> like a good husband. Amen. She said, go ahead. Go ahead. And we went down there. There was probably like four armor bearers. A tackle that tackled us as we were coming into church. I'm like, I got, I got Brother Damien here. And you know you bless when your armor bearer has an armor bearer. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience. And I mean, they was all over us. I had so many bottles of water thrown in my eye. I had two, two handkerchiefs. I had my black handkerchief because it's classy. Thank you, Sister Liz, Pastor Bev. Then I had their white handkerchief that I wondered if it had been laundered a couple times. It was clean. I'm just being funny. But I mean, I, has, I was in excess. And so when we walked in there, we just adapt. We just flow. We're in our harvest season. We adjust. How long do you say you want me to preach? Do you see what I'm saying? I just learned how to flow where I'm at. Gave honor to the house. Gave honor to the angels of the house. Anytime I ever stand in someone's pulpit, I always give honor. We just adjust. But when you're living in your harvest season, you don't have to even have all that. When you're in your harvest season, God will call you out of a crowd. Hundreds of people, and he'll call you out. You won't have to look extra eager. You just be you. You know you've been through your plowing season. You know you've been in your seed time season. You've been waiting and weeding. And now you enter into a harvest season where breathing is like prayer, is like breathing. And now you're walking into stuff that you never thought you would. 
seeing things come to pass in your life, you are able to submit to authority. My God, my God. It used to be a resistance because I'm trying to be something, I'm trying to look like something, I'm trying to... Mm, mm, the struggle's real, y'all. The struggle's real. But when you're in your harvest season, you just flow. You're no longer insecure because when you've been affirmed, you don't have to prove yourself. Well, if I sing better, they'll like me. I've seen this a lot in, in different cultures, in church culture, for real, where we will bring singers up and we want them to perform, but we treat them like trash. Come on. Just treat them. We want their gift. And so what happens in some cultures are we keep putting ourselves under that. Because we think, well, if I play better, maybe they'll like me. Because we have faced rejection so many times in our life. I feel the Holy Ghost right here. We face so many rejections that we feel we have to overspeak, overperform. But when favor is upon your life, you may just say the minimal. God, do it. He knows what you went through. But when you are His and you belong to Him, you don't have to be insecure. I know who my daddy is. I'm in my harvest season because daddy said so. You can be open with your friends without fear of rejection. Your past is no longer something that haunts you. So I, I release that to you tonight to say that the harvest season is available, but don't forget the plowing season. Don't forget the seed time season. Don't forget the weeding and the waiting. Amen? Don't forget those seasons where God says, I got to take you through this and allow you to walk through this so I can get you to the harvest season. Father, I pray, God, for every person that's here tonight that thought they were making a sacrifice just to come to Wednesday night, but it really wasn't a sacrifice. It was just, it was just the least I could do. But even in the least that I could do, I want to thank the Lord for everybody that came, that made, that spent gas. Some of them, some people tonight, God had to get a bus or an Uber to get here. Some people got childcare and babysitters so they could get here. Some people worked right up to the minute and came right in their uniform from work, but they got here because there's something about pressing, something about exchanging. There's something about saying, God, I know that you're good. and I don't understand everything that's happened in my life these last five years. I don't understand why I had to go through this physical condition. I don't understand why things were twisted. I don't understand when I kept trying to put my best foot forward and I kept slipping back. I don't understand your ways, God. And it's okay to say that to God because God said that his ways are past finding. You don't always understand the mystery of God. You don't understand why he doesn't give you the timing. He, he, he gave me this dream. He gave me this vision. He gave me direction. If I, before I even get to the altar call, if God's talking to you tonight and you have a dream, come to this altar and fall, fall down in the presence of God. You have a dream. You know God gave you a dream. Don't wait for me to get to the next part of this. If he's speaking to you now, you know you got a dream. You got a vision. You got a call. You, got, you know God said something. And it's, it won't leave you alone. And maybe you're here tonight and you got the direction, but you don't have the timing. And you've been praying. You've gone to every conference. You've been to everybody's meeting. You've been liking and following every Facebook prophet. You've been trying to get a word. And there's they, nothing wrong to be, there's nothing wrong to continually come to him. It, it's your continual coming. There's nothing wrong with the continual coming. 
Even the unjust judge rewarded the woman who came continually. She would not leave him alone till finally he gave her what she wanted. The unjust judge, hallelujah. And yet we serve a God that is just and loves us and will withhold no good thing from us. Come on, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. You have direction all over your life. Come on, if you're a singer and you need to come, if you're on the camera, you need to come. Come on, whatever it is, don't wait on anybody else. Just find you a place and say, I know I have direction in my life. I feel this so strong. Thank you so much for joining us online today. We hope you've had a powerful experience. We want to take this time to personally help you navigate the next steps in becoming connected. If you've made a decision for Christ today, need prayer, or want more information about our church, you can visit our website at bfwc.net. Also, if you didn't get a chance to give online during today's message and would like to contribute financially, you can visit us at bfwc.net forward slash giving and choose the option that works best for you. We look forward to hearing from you and God bless.